seasoned pastor, that's what they always say. <laughs> Not just he's old, he's been doing this a long time. Hi, Gateway. Great to be with you all. Recognize some faces from uh, the men's deal we had together. What was that, last January, I guess. That was a great time. So why are we here? Why did you come in this building? This is the church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. Why, why are we still meeting? This guy lived and died almost 2,000 years ago. Why, why are we still doing this? And it all goes back to the fact that he was publicly executed, uh, physically humiliated, abused, tortured, and hung out to die under the hot Israeli sun, and they buried him. And then three days later, the Roman army and the Jewish uh, leadership, uh, the high priest bodyguards, nobody could find the body. And those 12 guys, 11 at that point, who were scared to death and hiding out during the crucifixion now are willing to bare their neck for the truth that they saw him alive. That's why you're here. Because the tomb is empty and he's resurrected and he's alive and he's still calling people to himself. Isn't that astounding? So that here we are on the other side of the planet still meeting as the church of Jesus Christ. The other question that I would ask you is, well, why am I here? Because if you'd ask me, I'm a, I'm a native. Anybody a native of Arizona? Yeah, we should get something for that, shouldn't we, man? Get a <laughs> free license plate or something for that. If you'd asked me back at uh, my church in high school, I was at Scottsdale High, uh, if you drive on Indian School in Miller Road, where it used to be, there's, I think, a street called Scottsdale Highway. They, I guess they looked at the alumni record and said, you know, this has really been a bummer. We're going to just roll the school out. It's not working. But uh, if you'd asked me in high school, what do you want to be when you grow up, Sandy? Uh, pastor, if there was a list of 100 careers, pastor would be 101. You know, I just, why would you want to be a religious guy? And the pastors in my church wore robes and they chanted the liturgy and I knew they went to the hospital and did funerals. And as a teenage, young, uh, full of testosterone guy, there was nothing about that activity that was interesting. But then something happened, something remarkable, something for which I take uh, no credit. Uh, back in uh, March of 74, as the earth's crust was still hardening, uh, <laughs> Jesus, the living Christ, reached into my frat bedroom where I was hung over from too much fraternizing and grabbed that little pathetic frat boy and said, you're mine and I have never gotten over it. Uh, four days later, I led my girlfriend to Christ, and that's my wife now of, uh, I think it's 46 years now together. And yeah, let's applaud for good and long marriages, huh? She gets all the credit for that one, doesn't she? So why are you here? Why are you here? Let's pray just for a moment together, shall we? Lord Jesus, I just have every confidence that you are in this place. You said it would be so. We've gathered in your name, we've worshiped you, we've read your word, how could you not be? And uh, it never escapes me that you know every story, you know every life in the seat. You know the hairs on their head. You know their heartbreaks, you know their hopes, their dreams, you know their pain, their courage, their fear, their doubts, you know it all. And you love them. Oh God, may they dare to believe that amazing truth that you love them. To the glory of Christ we pray, amen. So First John. Uh, John was one of the few to not get martyred, killed in the prime of his ministry. Uh, and he pastored that church in Ephesus. I know Luke gave you that background. By the way, I love Luke, your pastor, and I'm delighted that I could be here today. Uh, I think I was like his 15th choice, but still, I'm <laughs> delighted to be here with you today. Uh, so John, 
was one of these minds, I mean, his, his gospel. Uh, you know, we always tell new Christians, you should read the gospel of John. If you're a new Christian, read the gospel of John. Really, uh, the first paragraph of John is, is so mystical. In the beginning was the word. Where's Jesus? No, he, he's, the word was with God. The word is God. All things have come to being through him. Wow. So John loved to, to simplify things. And now as he's this aged pastor, theologian, witness to the life and death, resurrection of Jesus himself, saw it. What does he want to be sure we get? And that's what 1 John is doing. It, it's just driving stakes in the basics, things that you've got to get clear. That God is light. That is, there's no darkness in him. There's no shadow There's no ulterior motive. There's nothing to suspect with God. He'll never be up to something untoward or uh, unhappy or cruel or, or capricious. He's light. He's pure. He's good. He's holy. And though he is all that, he is also love. And John's going to make that statement, as you heard the scripture being read, God is love. Now we don't reverse that. We don't say love is God. That sounds kind of romantic and idealistic. No, God is love. God is love. And John says, because God is love, you and I ought to love each other and we ought to love our neighbor as we see needs. That it's a love that takes action. And John is trying to clarify, do you know Jesus? That's the words he uses. He'll use it here again. If you, if you love God, if you've been loved by God, then you know God. He wants you to know that you know. He'll, he'll say that in the last chapter. I've written these things so that you'll know. You shouldn't go around wondering. You should know that you are his, that you love him. And as we'll see in our passage today, the only reason you love him is because he initiated an action of salvation, conversion, and love in your heart, and you responded. That's the beauty of the gospel. But John also doesn't want us to make cheap what costs God everything. And that's always been the temptation. It, it started in the first century. So John has to write in the first chapter. Now, uh, you know, if you say you've never sinned, you call God a liar. You've sinned, but you have an advocate in Christ. So don't, don't make light of your sin. Don't brush it under the rug. Own it, admit it, and let the cleansing work of the Spirit of God set you free from that truth. But, but sin is a reality in your life. You've been found out, dear one. You've been found out. You can't hide from him. But the greater news is you've been found. You've been found. So John is concerned that early on, people are just kind of taking for granted what was purchased for them and making light of sin and its heinousness to the Father and the damage it does to them and to their relationships. They're claiming to know Christ, but they don't have love for each other. They're making the grace of God cheap. And that's always been an issue. It's an issue today in the American church. There's a a temptation because we're so familiar with this gospel to make it something very familiar, make it cheap, make it easy, make it accessible. Well, God wants it to be accessible, but he never wanted it to be cheap. I found a wonderful definition from one of my heroes of the faith, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Way to go, guys. All right. Uh, He was executed at the age of 39 for being part of a plot to uh, take out Hitler. It's interesting because as an early theologian, young pastor, he was a pacifist, but as he saw the damage that evil personified was doing to his country and potentially to the world, he uh, became persuaded that there was a time when evil needed to be confronted and dealt with. uh, He also wrote one of the most profound books on discipleship called The Cost of Discipleship. If you want to get an introduction to Bonhoeffer, get his book, The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, uh, he defines cheap grace. And you guys are way ahead of me. Way to go, Booth. They're wide awake back there. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. 
It's that, uh, do you want to go to heaven? Yeah, well, pray this prayer. Okay, pray this prayer. Uh, Jesus died for you. Okay, you believe that? I believe that. Okay, good. You're going to heaven. Put that in your back pocket. And when you die, he'll let you in the gate. You know, the barcode will go beep and you'll be let in. Is that, is that what it is? That's, that's forgiveness without repentance. That's forgiveness without facing the truth about you. Why do you need forgiveness? Tell the truth. I'm greedy, I'm lustful, I'm mean, I'm selfish, I am lost, and I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to turn and I want to follow you. That's repentance. That's, that shows you've really got the message. Baptism without church discipline. When I'm, when I'm baptized, I submit to Christ and I submit to the leadership of my fellowship. That's, people don't want that today. They want baptism, but leave me alone. I want to be baptized because I heard that's a good thing, but leave me alone. Uh, don't, don't challenge me in the issues in my life that are damaging me and other people. That's my business. I'll sue you. <laughs> Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Jesus' invitation was never uh, come pray this prayer so you can go to heaven. You've read it. What's his invitation? It's just consistent. Follow me. Follow me. I, I want disciples. I want followers. I want students. I want learners. I want friends. I don't just want converts. Cheap grace says Jesus just wants numbers. You know, every Sunday, what's the count, Father? Okay, we're up to, you know, one billion. Two. No. He wants you. And he wants all of you. He wants you to follow him, to live his life with him. That's discipleship. It's the call to follow me. And it's, it's costly. It's costly. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living incarnate. Thank you, Dietrich. So this was an issue from the very beginning in the church of Ephesus is, as it is an issue for us. And I think the solution, and John understood this, is come to grips in a deeper way with the love of Christ for you. Let's redefine love. Love. How is it that I can say, I love cheeseburgers and I love my wife Margie and I use the same word? That doesn't honor her very much. I love old westerns and classic cars and I love my grandkids. At least the Greeks had four well-known words for love, right? They had storge, familiar, family kind of love. They had eros, erotic love. And then uh, they had uh, phileo, which was uh, brotherly love, like the city of Philadelphia, brotherly love. And then they had agape. And the New Testament, when it talks about the love of God, it uses agape, which is a self-giving love. So love needs to be redefined for you and me, particularly in our culture. In fact, one commentator made a great observation was helpful for me. He said, I love you in our culture today. I love you has come to mean you please me. That's a little less than unconditional, isn't it? You please me. That helps you understand why marriages are struggling. I love you because you please me. Well, what if you stop pleasing me? Mm. That's what love means in our culture. Love means you please me. I love you because you please me. Not the love of God. Let's look in 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. It's his invention. It's, it's the mark of everything he makes. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. Now, when you read the Old Testament, anybody read the Old Testament? It's in there. It's the first part of your Bible. Way to go. In the Old Testament, right away after the, the nation of Israel gets out of the ghettos of Egypt and they're on their own, uh, Moses is given this, this methodology for worship and it's centered around animal sacrifice. So there's, there's blood and uh, fire and the aroma of burning flesh and this huge message that sin is costly, right? I mean, 
when, when an animal is killed and there's blood and there's blood on the priest and there's blood on the altar, you can't miss the message, wow, this is serious. And so the Israelites got the message, God is holy. In fact, when Moses went up to meet with God, he said, you come alone, nobody else can come and don't even let them touch the mountain we're meeting on. So they got the message, God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When Isaiah has his vision of heaven, he has a vision of angels and the throne of God and, and the song, the cry out is holy, holy, holy. So when we read the Old Testament, we get the message, God is holy. Now John's coming and saying, God is love. And it's my conviction that in, in, you need to start with the holiness of God, and that's what makes his love so profound. If you don't start with the holiness of love, God, the holiness of God, you're, you're, you're prone to make kind of this soft center Jesus, you know, that's just love, love, love. Jesus loves everybody, loves you. Oh, Jesus so loving. But if you start with the holiness of God, a God who is righteous and pure, he, he's light itself. There's nothing uh, dark in God, nothing sinful in God. And this God, this holy, righteous, powerful, awesome creator of all things loves you. Huh? That's why the, the early uh, listeners of Jesus struggled with that. What? You're, the kingdom's with us. The kingdom's in you. The kingdom can be in me. No, I'm sinful. And that was the power of the cross. Yes, you are. And that's been dealt with. God is love. Flows out of who he is. Look what he says in the, the book, verse 9. This is how we know the love of God. This is how it was manifested. You with me, verse 9? God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Our whole walk is a life through Christ. And this is love. Not that we love God. It's not about how much you can conjure up love for God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a word, I'm um, sorry about the front row, I can't say that word without spitting a little bit, can you? Let's try it, propitiation, propitiation. It means that the enmity was taken away. The enmity, the, the, the righteous uh, anger against you and me from a holy God for our sin. He's right that he is angry toward our sin, our disobedience. We've made light of him and his law and his truth. And there's enmity, but he loves you. So the Father, Son, and Spirit have this conversation in heaven. What are we going to do? We love our creation. We love her. We love him. But there's sin. We can't just ignore that. That would be unholy. That would be unrighteous. That would be unjust. And Jesus steps up. Jesus steps up and says, I'll take it. I'll take the wrath. I'll take the punishment. Really, son? Yes, Father. I'll take it. That's what's going on in Gethsemane. As the actual experience of becoming that sin offering for you and me, he's looking at it wide-eyed and says, Father, is there another option, another way? No, son. You know this is the only way. And the consequence of my sin and your sin, the sin of all who are his focused on one human being looks like this. Gentlemen, that's awful. And it's shocking. And that's what it costs for one man to become the propitiation the satisfaction of our sin, the price, the wage of our sin, that's, that's what it cost.
Thank you, man. You know, in the, uh, some of you, anyone here grow up in the Catholic tradition? Anybody? And when you would come into worship, there still was an image of Jesus on the cross. And sometimes as Protestants, you know, we, uh, we take pride in, well, my Jesus isn't still on the cross. My Jesus is resurrected. And that's true. And that's a great truth. And we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. But I think it's good. Just like on a regular basis that Israelite had to go to the synagogue or the temple and see the animal have its life taken from it and its blood shed and see the blood on the priest and smell the smoke. It was good just to remind them this is what it cost. It's good for you and I sometimes to look at the cross and remember. Because that's the foundation of my response. You did that for me, Lord. You were turned into a bloody pulp for the likes of me. What can I give for that? I'll give you me. That's what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, as he's laid out the whole grace of God in the first 11 chapters. Romans 1 to 11 lays out uh, the truth that you and I are sinful and there's no hope for us and the price of sin is death, but Jesus has taken our place and now we have all this amazing resources spiritually. Chapter 8, we have the Spirit interceding and whispering to the Father our deepest longings and needs and our life is secure. In fact, it's a done deal. No one can take us from him. We're his all the way home into the next life. And as Paul paints this a marvelous picture of the grace of God and all that we have in Christ, then he comes to chapter 12 and he says, now, I, I beg you, he says, I beseech you, in light of all that you have in Christ, pray this little prayer so you go to heaven. <laughs> I beg you, give your whole body a living sacrifice. That's your acceptable act of worship. That's the only reasonable thing you could do is you look at the cross and you see what it cost the son. How could you do anything less but say, here I am, here I am, you can have me. Whatever you want to do with me, wherever you want to take me, I'm yours. Because I will never get over what you have done for the likes of me. Hmm. That's love, dear ones. That's love. I love uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite, just succinct, beautiful statements about this truth. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. <laughs> you, look to your right and left. Does anyone next to you look like the righteousness of God? But we are. In the eyes of the Father, he sees us through his Son. Oh, it's just astounding. It's too much. And you don't think about it enough, dear one. You don't. You think too much about the stuff of this world, which on the other side, what was that again? A car payment? Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. You are the righteousness of God because he who knew no sin became sin for the likes of you and me. Wow. Let's go back to 1 John 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, it just makes sense, doesn't it? We ought to love one another. Now, no one has seen God at any time. Now, don't get confused there. Yeah, John saw Jesus, but he's saying the fullness of God the fullness of God that Moses wasn't allowed to see, that God said, I'll hide you in a, a crack in this rock and you'll see my backside. So no one can see the full glory and expression of God and live. It's too much. That's what he's talking about, not Jesus. So he says, no one has seen the fullness of God any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. 
We see and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We've come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Here's, here's the wild part. You still with me, everybody awake? Verse 17. By this love is perfected with us. That word perfection comes up several times. It means fulfilled, made complete, mature. So by this, this love is made complete, matures in us, so that we'll have confidence on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also we are in this world. We're his now. There's no fear in love. Verse 18, look at that. If you don't get anything else today, get this. There is no fear in love. Perfect love, fully developed, mature love casts out fear. Fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. The most important thing you can do for your marriage is to live in the fullness of the love of God for you. The most important thing you can do as a parent is to live in the fullness of the love of God for you. The most important thing you can do as an employer, as an employee, is to live in the fullness of God because the person who is deeply loved is a delight to live with, is a delight to work for, is a delight to work with because they've been delivered from I love you because you please me and now they just love you because they love you because they are loved like that. The fullness of love. You and I need to spend more time abiding in the fullness of God's love. You see how he says that all through here, abide in him. God is love, abide in his love, verse 16. Jesus says again in John 15, abide in my love. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. How has the Father loved Jesus? Well, he's never abandoned him except for that moment on the cross. He's given him everything. He's given the greatest name in all history, in all time, all names, all knee, all tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I mean, he's exalted his son. He loves his son, give anything to his son. And Jesus dares to say, as the father loves me, I love you like that. I mean, this stuff is so big. It's... It's just too much. We tend to back away and live in in the little things. Like, will God give me a parking space at Costco today? Or whatever. Oh gosh, I love Costco, by the way. No, we're not to point three yet. Thank you, guys. See, you're a little ahead of me. Don't push me now. Come on. What does it mean to abide in His love? Here's. The contrast that's so easy. When you get bad news, the doctor calls and the biopsy has something in it. That's all you think about. You, you are shut down. You are, all you're abiding in is the bad news. There's been an accident. There's been a death. When there's bad news, you and I, we don't have to train ourselves, boom. That's, that's all we're thinking about. We're just thinking all about the bad news. What Jesus is saying, what John is saying is train yourself, it won't come naturally, train yourself to be in the good news that whatever comes, you are loved. What does the love of God mean for you? His eye is never off you. Anything you go through, he's with you in it. When you die, you won't really die. You'll fall asleep and wake up. Dallas Willard said, we may not even know we're in heaven when we first get there. Because it won't be trauma. Like it is for those who don't know him. I've been in hospital rooms. I've seen both. I've seen that person die that didn't know Christ. And it's horrific. It's horrific. It's horrific. And I've been in that room where the person dies that knows Christ and it's precious and it's sweet. And if there's not too much uh, morphine, they begin to see angels and loved ones who are waiting for them. You have nothing to worry about, really. You are home free. Romans 8 says you're already glorified. You're in, you're his. 
Jesus said, nobody snatches you out of my hand. Nobody. Not the devil, nobody. You are mine. You are secure. That's why Jesus, when the boat was starting to sink on the Sea of Galilee, and the guys are all upset, and, hey, master, don't you care? And he gets up, oh, shut up, ocean. You know. But he wasn't afraid, and he wanted them to get it. So what if you die? See, Jesus has kind of a nonchalant attitude about death. We are so freaked out, oh, death. Oh. Jesus is like, if you knew what was coming, how did Paul put it? I has not seen, it has not even entered the imagination of men what God has prepared for those who love him. You are loved. Whatever comes to you, you will not be alone. He will be with you. He will give you grace to go through. Yeah, people who love Christ, they still get cancer. They still have car accidents. They still get laid off. But in the midst of it, Christ meets them. Those have been some of my sweetest experience with Christ is in the midst of a very hard thing and he shows up. Train yourself to abide in the love of God. It's not natural. You'll have to read this. You'll have to memorize these verses. You'll have to talk about it in your RC and with your friends. You need to train yourself to live in the love of God. That's your strength that's the core of your worship and your service. It's got to come out of this nuclear reactor of love because God has loved the likes of you. That's what he wants. Paul says to the Ephesian church, remember Ephesians 3, here's my prayer, that you would know the height and depth and breadth and width of what? The love of Christ. The love of Christ is your, your, your fuel, your food, your life. It's so hard for us to believe it. So easy to live in the bad news. That's John's hope. No fear. Don't you love that? If you really knew you were loved, you would not be afraid. Whatever it is you're worrying about right now, God is so much bigger. And he'll be with you. Let it go. Let it go. That's the clue that you're not living in his love as you're still living in a lot of fear. His solution is not to scold you, it's to say, wait, let's stop. Think about what I did for you. You think I'm gonna let you go? You think I'm gonna take my eye off you? Do you see what my son had experienced for you? you we, we speak your name all the time in glory. What if you really believed you were loved like that? Well, then you could do what John asked us to do at the end of our passage, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. The psalmist says, I love God and hates his brother. He's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. I always took issue with that. I can love you, God. I haven't seen you. It's the guy I can see. I have a hard time. Did you see him? See how he cut me off in his car? Did you see that? But that's the test. This is the commandment. Love one another. Oh, church. If we could fight as hard for love as we do for right theology, right answers. Oh, what a fellowship we might be. Fight for love. Let love win the day here at Gateway. Because you are loved. You are loved. Let's pray together. My prayer is that you would this week dare to abide in the truth of the love of God for you. I invite you to think about it every day this week. Read this passage. Read John 15. Read Psalm 23. I invite you every day this week, give yourself the gift of abiding in God's love for you. Get perfected, matured, fulfilled in love so that fear will flee. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. May it be so to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church.
Amen. Thanks, Sammy. Mm -hmm.